We move into the spiritual warfare again of the New Testament as we look at our text for tonight. Acts 13, verses 6 through 12 is the text, the message entitled Sorcerers and Signs. You recall last week we have the beginning of the first missionary journey in verses 1 through 5 with the Apostle Paul being sent forth, still known as Saul, and Barnabas being sent with him, Barnabas being listed first in verse 2. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And that is what the Holy Spirit said as they fasted and ministered to the Lord. God separated and sent Barnabas and Saul. It was to a work that he had called them to, not a work that they had chosen to go to. And then we find more fasting and prayer in verse 3, the laying on of hands, and then the church sending them away. So they are sent by the Holy Spirit, verse 4, and they are also sent by the church. They depart to Seleucia, and from thence they sail to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. The first striking thing that we noted last week was the contrast between verses 2 and 5, where the Holy Spirit specifically called and commissioned Barnabas and Saul, but John Mark went with them without the specific direction of the Holy Spirit in verse 5. He simply tagged along, perhaps the first some team, but with a young man that was not prepared to go. And we noted that it's always a dangerous thing to enter into ministry without the specific and clear call of God. And we noted the warnings of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 6 and 7 that relate to warfare with the devil, because verses 6 through 12 give us the first major clash on this missionary journey uh, with Satan and his demonic hosts. First Timothy 3, 6 and 7 said, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So three warnings about the things that you might encounter related to the devil, the condemnation of the devil, the reproach of the devil, and the snare of the devil. The condemnation of the devil is pride. We discussed that in some detail. It's very clear from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, with his five great I wills. When you put a novice in a position of honor and authority and leadership, you do him no favors. You merely set him up for future destruction. You see, this young man did not know how to wear the spiritual armor first. And when a young man gets into that kind of a position, he may soon discover himself very badly wounded by the enemy. Pride, the condemnation of the devil. The second warning is the reproach of the devil. We saw that's a meaning, a word that means to revile, to rail at, to upbraid, to chide, to taunt because of disgrace or notoriety. It was a double-pronged warning. First, it deals with the scornful character of the devil, who is a reviler and who rails against all that is holy. And then we saw, second, it deals with what will happen to the believer that falls into the reproach of the devil. He will be scorned and disapproved by others. Uh, when he is scorned for the sake of Christ, that is good, but when he is scorned or reproached for the sake of being character like Satan, uh, that is very bad. The reproach of Christ is good, reproach is bad when it is the reproach of the devil. The third warning we saw was the snare of the devil, pagis, a specific kind of trap that is a deadly noose. It is designed to strangle you or jerk your foot off the ground and leave you hanging. And the Apostle Paul explains this in chapter 6 of the very same book. He tells us what one of the principal snares of the devil is, and he uses this same word. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men and destruction and perdition. In chapter 2 of the second epistle to Timothy, he uses that same word again, and he says it's possible to get out of it. It says that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. That's a temptation that Satan can use to trip you up or catch you on many occasions if you have a covetous spirit. Then we saw the entire context of that, which is in the context of teaching true doctrine versus teaching false doctrine. And Paul warns Timothy, Thou, O man of God, flee these things, follow after righteousness. Our discussion this morning, I hope you remember, 
Godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith. This is spiritual warfare in which we are involved. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I give thee charge in the sight of God. And that's a military charge. That is an indication of what the commander-in-chief tells his troops what they are supposed to be doing as they go into battle. We're about to see some of that in our text tonight. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he mentions money again down in verse 17. Charge them that be rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. That's the word for share. Take what God has given them and share it, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And then we saw that as they were sent forth, they left the mainland and they headed for Salamis, uh, excuse me, from Salamis to Cyprus, where they were about to begin the missionary journey. That brings us to verse 6. And when they were gone through the isle and Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bargesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Interesting to have an unbeliever actually call you up and say, I would like for you to come and preach to me. That's what happened with them here. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, not a very complimentary uh, appellation, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Here we get back to that issue of righteousness. It's all over the New Testament, folks. And Satan is the enemy of righteousness. He hates it when you live a righteous life. He hates it when you do that which is right in the sight of God. Thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now remember our context here. It's the first missionary journey. We're now on the island of Cyprus. The first landfall after leaving the mainland at Seleucia in verse 4 was Salamis. Salamis is the extreme eastern end of Cyprus. There were already multiple Jews settled there because we see that there were multiple synagogues. When they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. So there's already a large colony of Jews because they have more than one synagogue in that town. The standard practice of Paul on all of his missionary journeys was always to make contact with the Jews and preach at the synagogues first of all before he went anywhere else. He went to cities predominantly and primarily in his journeys where pockets of Jews were already established. And from there he could reach the largest number of people after establishing a beachhead in the Jewish community. There were at least ten different reasons for doing this. First of all, he was a man trained by one of the greatest rabbis in history, Gamaliel, considered one of the top seven Rambans in all of Jewish history even today. That was the man who taught Saul, who became Paul. And so because of that, he had an automatic opening for the preaching in the synagogues instead of having to just preach cold turkey on the street, although he did that sometimes, as on Mars Hill, when he was preaching in Athens. Second, his audience would already have a background in the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. 
so he wouldn't have to start from the beginning and begin to build a foundation before he could share Christ with them. Third, his audience would already have a background of knowing their inability to keep the law of Moses for salvation. These are people that the law had sensitized, and when Paul preached Christ as the fulfillment of the law, they were ready to hear. Fourth, his audience would already have an understanding of divine revelation and the authority of Scripture. It's a very important point. We should not overlook it. The Jews already had a respect for divine revelation. They knew that God had given the law to Moses. They knew that God had spoken through the prophets. And so Paul would not have had to have developed the concept of biblical authority first. When he went, he could make an initial beachhead in the Jewish community which already knew the scripture and by going to the synagogue he would be reaching those who were religious Jews and not merely secular Jews. Fifth, there was an expectancy among the Jews at this time that Messiah was about to appear. We find from about 100 BC that there was a growing sense that it was about time for the Messiah to come. People began to get a sense from the prophecies both of Jeremiah and of Daniel that the time was about ripe now for the Messiah to come. And so there would have been an expectancy in these synagogues that Messiah was about to appear. Sixth, God had chosen the Jewish people to be the conduit through whom the Messiah would come. And so it made sense to go first to these Jewish communities and speak in the synagogues because this was the conduit, the Jewish nation, through whom the Messiah would come. It was promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, where God gave the promise to Abraham concerning his seed. And as we get through the promises in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, Genesis 21, where the promises are restated both to Abraham and then to Isaac and then to Jacob about this one who would be the seed, that is the Messiah, not merely the multitude of the Jews who also are promised there, but specific promises concerning, as Paul says in Galatians, thy seed, singular, which is Christ. And so as we look at the prophecies of Scripture, these Jewish people knew that they were the conduit through whom the Messiah would come. The next thing we discover is that Jesus went first in his earthly ministry to the lost house of Israel. We see that very clearly by the way in which he spoke to the Syrophoenician woman who came and begged him to cast the daughter of the demon out of her daughter and Jesus said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, but the dogs do eat of the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And Jesus said, because of your faith, your daughter is healed. And she went home and found her daughter was healed. The demon was gone. But Jesus went first to the lost house of Israel. The second thing we see in the Gospels also is that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two during his earthly ministry only to the Jews. He told them not to go to the Gentiles. That was because that was planned for another occasion. As we move into the book of Acts, we've seen where he came to the Samaritans, who are half Jewish and half Gentile. And then he uh, brings in the Ethiopian eunuch at the end of Acts chapter 8, where the Samaritans occur in the first part of that chapter. And the Ethiopian eunuch is 100% Gentile by birth, but Jewish by religion. But he's neither male nor female. He's a eunuch. And then finally we find the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 are being brought in. But it was to the Jews first. We find it's Jewish men in Acts chapter 2 where the gospel is first proclaimed. Next, number 9, Paul could and frequently did immediately gather a following of faithful Messianic Jews as a support base for food, clothing, prayer, and financial support so that he could continue his missionary journey. In his epistles, he makes reference to various churches that he planted, and he says, this church supported me, this church helped with that, uh, this church sent messengers with me. Uh, as he traveled and planted churches, these groups of believers became active in their support of the Apostle Paul. And it was almost always a situation where the Jewish community was reached first and then Gentiles were brought in, and that is the tenth thing. 
The tenth reason, he could establish a home base in the region where he could attach new converts, not only from among the Jews, but also from his Gentile converts, who then would come in after he had established that home base. Paul explains that action plan for spiritual penetration of new regions in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We see that was his practice as we move through the book of Acts. So it's no surprise that when he comes to the island of Cyprus and when he reaches the city of Salamis, the first place he goes is to the multiple synagogues of the Jews that are there in that location. I suspect the Apostle Paul had a good idea of the network where communities of Jews were scattered throughout the uh, Middle East in the ancient Roman Empire. And so as he plans his missionary journeys, we see him going to these various synagogues from place to place. Also, we some discover something else, that the Jews would be the first to be held accountable, and so they were the first to hear. Paul explains that in Romans chapter 2, verse 9, and Romans chapter 2, verse 10. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first, and also of the Gentile. Same phraseology that he used back in chapter 1 for the proclamation of the gospel. Verse 10, But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentile. You get a pattern. You see that Paul is preaching and explaining what he is actually doing as we move here into this first missionary journey. So from the town of Salamis on the eastern extreme end of Cyprus, they traveled westward and inland to the capital city of Paphos. That's the next thing that is mentioned here, the next city that is mentioned in the text. That city still exists today. The city today is known as Baffa, B-A-F-F-A. Paphos was famous for the worship of the Roman goddess Venus. It was a center of government, a center of commerce, and a center of immorality, just like Corinth, but there it's centered around the goddess of carnal love, Venus. It was also a center of a lot of pagan activity. It's interesting to note that Paul's second target, and that's very interesting, after the synagogues, where did he go? He went to the government. <laughs> Most of us tend to shy away from that, tend to shy away from trying to witness to officials in positions of authority. Though in this case, that official called for Barnabas and Saul to come and preach to him. But his second target was a high government official, Sergius Paulus, the Roman deputy of the country. That's a proconsul. He was the man who was in charge of the entire island of Cyprus. He's described as prudent. When we look at the word prudence, we discover it is a a combination of wisdom, intelligence, and learning or knowledge. This was a man who had his act together. He was a man who was known for his judicious behavior and his wise decisions. Because of his position in government, Sergius Paulus was also a target, not merely for the gospel, but he was a target for Satan. If you can control the man in power, you can control the people of the country. We've seen that kind of a battle going on in the halls of government in the United States. For the last 200 years, there has been that kind of a struggle. Satan has always been trying to get his men into positions of authority and power at every level and in every branch of government. That's the reason that demonic power is often concentrated in the seats of government around the world. For example, we see illustrations of this in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 10, verses 4 and following. And in the fourth and twentieth year of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude." And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. 
Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned me in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard a voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands, and he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, Understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Daniel had been praying and fasting to understand the vision that God had given. And he said, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Now in the next few verses we learn something very important about spiritual warfare and why we should never give up in our prayer life. Because Satan does not want to see us have answers to our prayers. He does not want us to understand the word of God. He does not want us to receive divine help. God can and sometimes does directly help with his own hand. But here we discover that God was going to use an angelic being to answer Daniel's question. But listen to what it says. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. That's three full weeks. He was sent to answer Daniel, but a demonic force called the Prince of the Kingdom of Persia withstood him for twenty-one days. This is a powerful angelic being. Daniel falls trembling like jelly on his face when that angel appears. Notice what it says next. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. And he gives Daniel an understanding of what would befall Daniel's people, that is, the Jews, in the latter days. We don't go into that tonight, but... I want to give you that illustration of the spiritual warfare that is going on and the way in which Satan and his demonic forces withstand the proclamation of the gospel and withstand the answers to be given to God's elect, to his saints. I think the next thing that's interesting to notice here in this text is that the tool that Satan used was also a Jew, just like Paul. In other words, he's someone who would have known the scriptures, but who had given himself over to the dark side of the spiritual world. Look at verse 6. When they were gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Now, there are no wasted words in scripture. God put that there to remind us of something, to tell us something, that here is someone who had had access to the scriptures. Here is someone who was probably raised in one of those synagogues. Here is someone who somewhere along the line decided that his faith in the God of Israel was not as exciting as what he could get and what he could obtain for himself by going over to the dark side. Satan wants to reach into not merely synagogues, and you recall Jesus went into a synagogue and there was a demon-possessed man in the synagogue who cried out against the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan tries to get into churches, too, with his people. There was a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus. I also think that it is no accident that he was named Bar-Jesus. That means son of of Jesus. Satan is a deceiver 
who tries to counterfeit everything that God does, confusing and mixing the truth with lies. By using that name, he does two things. Number one, it is a deceptive claim to authority as the son of Jesus. Satan always wants to claim authority that belongs only to God. Secondly, it's a slander against the name of Jesus. It not only tries to usurp his authority, but it is a slander against his name because Jesus was not married, nor did he have any children. Our Lord warns us that there would be many who came in his name, but they were not from him. Very clearly in Matthew chapter 7, he says, there are going to be those who come doing miracles in my name. But there's going to come a day when I'm going to say unto you, depart from me, ye accursed, I never knew you. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these miracles? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do wonders in your name? And he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart into outer darkness, into the lake of fire, be gone. There are those who have supernatural powers, and there are still some today, though they manifest not much in the United States, because that's not a culturally acceptable thing, but they do that manifestations in all the dark countries of the world where the gospel has not yet penetrated or penetrated much. Many come in the name of Jesus who are not from Jesus. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I fear lest by any means the serpent, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached. Here was a man who was claiming to be a prophet. He was a Jew claiming to know scripture. He was a man doing counterfeit miracles. He was a sorcerer. And Sergius Paulus, wanting to make sure that he had things right, had been using him as a source of knowledge and a source of power. He's a man who claimed to be the son of Jesus. If he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached. Clearly the Jesus that Elymas, that is his other name, preached, was not the Jesus of scripture. Or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, he was clearly motivated by demonic forces by Satan himself because that's the way in which Paul addresses him as a child of the devil if you receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted those are three warnings another Jesus another spirit another gospel and this man bar Jesus or Elymas was preaching a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel, because it says he withstood Saul. He tried to turn the deputy away from the faith. It was not merely an intellectual or scholastic difference in theology. He sought to turn away the deputy from the faith. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Paul says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's very strong language. Let him be damned to hell. That's how serious this issue is. That's why the Apostle Paul responds the way that he does when he's confronted with Elymas. In verse 9, Paul says it again, As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Bar Jesus, Elymas, is called two things. He's called a sorcerer, first of all, and then he's called a false prophet. 
Now, we'll not go into great detail on this because, as you know, months ago, I covered an entire section when we were dealing with the false prophets in chapter 8. You remember from our study of sorcerers and witchcraft earlier in Acts that a sorcerer included the entire field of the occult, and this man is called a sorcerer. That included necromancy, that is, those who try to contact the dead for favors or for information, necros, dead, and you know, that is really what Roman Catholic, uh, Catholic Church is trying to do when they pray to the saints. They are practicing necromancy. They are contacting the dead, asking them for favors to come and bring their petitions to Jesus. Folks, that is occultic. And that is in the Roman Catholic organization. Praying to the dead. Yes, we can pray to God in the name of Jesus, but Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead. It also included witches. It included those who cast spells and chant magic incantations to try to bring about certain results. It includes those who are mediums. A medium is someone who contacts demonic spirits for information to pass that information on to you and those who are involved in manifestations of psychic phenomena. You know, those who can bend spoons by looking at them hard, or those who can make objects bounce along the shelves, the poltergeist activity that goes on. Those who are involved in all the various occultic practices. A sorcerer covered that, the full range of occult practices. So he's called a sorcerer, first of all. The second thing he's called is he's called a false prophet. A false prophet is one who speaks in the name of the true God, but without authority and without a message from the true God. And the Bible tells us that the way to tell a false prophet was by testing the results of his prophecy. If he or she did not have 100% accuracy, they were to be stoned to death under the Mosaic law. Very clear from Deuteronomy 18, there are multiple passages, we'll give you just one of them. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 20 and following. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name. So here's a prophet who claims he's speaking in the name of the true God. But he has no authority. Because the next phrase says, which I have not commanded him to speak. So he has no authority and he has no message from the true God. Or that shall speak in the name of other gods. Even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? You know, we've got to be able to tell the difference, don't we? I mean, back then they had prophets, and they had false prophets. Today we don't have any real prophets. God has ceased giving revelation with the completion of the New Testament canon of Scripture. But we do have false prophets today. Here's the test, verse 22. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. God gives us very clear tests in the scripture concerning those who were sorcerers. And he said, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. He made it very clear that those who were involved in all the forms of occult were to be put to death. That was the Mosaic law, and it required it. We find that when Saul went to the witch at Endor, even though Saul had killed most of the witches and wizards and sorcerers in Israel, his servants knew immediately where to find one that he hadn't killed. When he wanted to go to one, they knew where one was located, the witch at Endor. And they took him to her. And she went through her incantations and her spells after Saul had promised her in the name of Jehovah that she would not die. He was in serious trouble. And suddenly, Samuel appeared, which was not what she was expecting. She was expecting normal demonic activity expecting her familiar spirit to show up, and she is terrified and drops out of the picture as 
Samuel communicates directly with Saul and not through the medium. And he is told that the next day he and his sons are going to die. And that's what happens. And even Jonathan, the good friend of David, is killed in that battle. And Saul and Jonathan are beheaded and their bodies are taken and hung on the Philistine walls and rescued by the men of Beit Shan who bury them. Serious issues involved. And so now we come to John Mark. He's traveling with Paul and Barnabas. And he's used to that first kind of Jew, those in the synagogues. He had no problem when they went to the synagogues at Salamis. And I suppose he was enjoying his missionary trip at that point. He was also familiar with the second kind of Jews. Those are the ones who rejected the gospel and persecuted Paul. And yes, he'd come in confrontation with those. That's you know, the typical opposition. And so he probably thought he was pretty well braced for that kind of a, a contrast. But here he's getting a taste of another kind of a Jew. An apostate who has actually been sold out to the devil. Here's a Jew who's engaged in demonic supernatural manifestations. I think that probably shook him up a little bit. Here's a Jew who is actively promoting anti-biblical practices of demons at the highest level of the local government. And I think it was probably a little bit too much for him, and he headed for home after this incident. I think there may have been a reason for that. And Paul explains it if you want to take your Bibles and look to Ephesians chapter 6. Because in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul describes the spiritual warfare and the way in which we have to be prepared for it. Beginning in verse 10, Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Before you put on anything on the outside, you have to be strengthened on the inside. You remember when David went out to do battle with Goliath? Saul tried to get David to wear Saul's armor. Saul was a huge man. He was the biggest man in Israel. He's the man who should have had to fight Goliath. But he was chicken on the inside. So here's this little runt of a teenage boy, probably with red hair and a ruddy complexion. He comes out and Saul says, look, you're going to go fight that big guy. We've got to put some armor on you. And probably Saul's breastplate went all the way from David's neck all the way down to his knees or below. And David is sort of lost in this big, big chunk of metal. And he said, I can't use this stuff. I haven't proved it. I don't know how to use this armor. And so he went out. But David was prepared on the inside. He said, I come to face you in the name of Jehovah of hosts. You have blasphemed the God of Israel. And he had the five small, smooth stones. We talked on Thanksgiving Day about Goliath and his four brothers. There were four brothers who wanted to get after David for having killed their brother Goliath. There were five stones. David only needed one for Goliath and everybody else ran, including Goliath's brothers, but there were other battles when those brothers tried to kill David. David started, we can say symbolically, with verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You never go into battle unless you are spiritually prepared. Not merely thinking of yourself as clad in this armor, though that is necessary, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but the strength that you go into battle is the strength of the Lord. Saul and Barnabas were called, commissioned, and sent by the Holy Spirit. And when Paul speaks to Elymas, it says he's filled with the Spirit of God in what he has to say. He's not talking off the cuff. He is speaking the word of God and confronting Satan's emissary directly. 
John Mark suddenly realizes he doesn't belong there. He suddenly realizes this is a battle for which he's not prepared. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That's treachery, trickery, opposition, attempting to confound you and confute you. Elymas is seeking to turn the deputy away from the faith. Satan's goal is not merely to do battle with us, it's to keep others from coming to Christ. seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know, what we see out there looks to us like flesh and blood. But what we don't see is what's behind it. The government leaders that we see the people who argue with us when we're trying to witness to someone else, and I've given you many illustrations of people to whom I've been witnessing, and suddenly the devil will throw somebody else into the conversation who wants to withstand the gospel and turn away the hearer from the faith. It's not normal, but it is demonic. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are four terms that are used there that are levels of military power. You don't know when you're going to come across one of those levels. Satan is at the top, but just like an army, he has all the demons organized at different echelons of military power so that he can exercise control and order. He's a brutal taskmaster. The demons do his bidding. But there are different levels of power. That's what Paul says here. He uses military levels of power when he talks about it. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. The apostle Paul at Paphos stood. John Mark ran. When the evil day comes, when you're confronted with the evil forces, the question is, what will you do? Are you internally prepared? And do you have on the armor of God? It's an armor that you should be familiar with using. David wasn't familiar with the armor that Saul had, but you and I should be familiar with the armor that God has given to us so that not we will retreat, but so that in the evil day we can withstand and we can, after having done all, stand. We hold our ground. Stand, therefore, he emphasizes it again in verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth. Having your loins girt about with truth protects the most sensitive parts of the body. Truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The dissemination of the seed of the word of God is what takes effect and causes life and growth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And having on the breastplate of what? It's what we were talking about this morning, wasn't it? The breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate covers your heart. It covers your kidneys. It covers the seat of your emotions. Not merely the spiritual center of your life, which is your heart, but the kidneys are used in scripture to speak of your emotions. The breastplate of righteousness. Without that, Without the righteousness, you are open to Satan's attack and to the shame and the scorn that the world brings because they see that you're living a life just like they're living. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Interesting moves first from the loins, then up toward the breastplate, 
and then down toward the feet. You've got to know what the gospel is. That's the only thing that can move forward. Your feet are what propel the body forward. It is the gospel of peace that we are carrying to those who are lost. We're not waiting for them to come. We are to carry it to those who are lost. And then he moves back up again. Take the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now, most of us probably, coming out of a Reformation tradition, would have probably wanted to start with faith. The just shall live by faith. We would have wanted to start with a shield. After all, that covers pretty much all of us, and we can always crunch down behind the shield, and it covers all of us. But if we do that, we don't see what's coming. If we do that and the devil comes in from the side, he can still hit our, our breastplate where it's not there, or our loins, or he can still trample on our feet. The fourth thing that's mentioned is the shield of faith, where if you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked... You see, Satan's going to throw doubts at you. He's going to make you question. He's going to make you think, is it worth it? He's going to make you think, is this really what I believe? Is this really what I'm supposed to preach? And then he lists the helmet of salvation. Well, maybe we should have started there. That's on the top, and then we could have worked our way down. God didn't do that. The helmet of salvation... That protects your mind. And the sword of the Spirit, that is your only offensive weapon, which is the Word of God. Interesting. Loins girt about with truth, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. He starts with Scripture and he ends with Scripture. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Two different images given by the Apostle Paul in this passage, one of a soldier in combat, the other of an ambassador. An ambassador is a man who brings terms of peace, makes reconciliation between countries, deals with them on a non-warfare basis. But here Paul is an ambassador in bonds. Can you imagine if a foreign country sent an ambassador to the United States and we suddenly decided to disregard diplomatic immunity and we grab the man and we throw him into prison? Cart him off to Leavenworth, put him in high security, feed him only bread and water, if that, leave him in the dark, burned out light bulb in his isolation cell. What do you think the other country would think if the United States broke diplomatic relationships in that way? Here's Paul, an ambassador in bonds, encouraging the soldiers on the field who are fighting the battle. He's been bringing a message of peace, but the enemy doesn't want peace. The enemy wants warfare. When I speak, David says, I am for peace, but they are for war. Remember, that's your enemy. That's Satan. And so we have a situation here where there's a young man who I think had not first internally mastered the art of being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Here's a young man who perhaps did not know enough of the scripture to be able to have on the girdle of truth. Perhaps there was something in his life that wasn't quite right. The breastplate of righteousness wasn't fully on. The shield of faith had been dropped somewhere along the line because the fiery darts of the wicked one got through to him. His feet weren't really shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Those sandals hadn't been latched up quite right because... When push came to shove and it was time to witness, he ran. Dear people, when God calls you, God empowers you. And we have no indication that John Mark had been called to this particular ministry. Now we're not told how Sergius Paulus heard about Saul and Barnabas, but 
He's the one who called for them. And this man, Bargesus, was also called Elymas. That's interesting, because here we find not an Aramaic, but an Arabic word in the New Testament. It's a word that means wise man. This is a man who was similar to the sorcerers in the book of Daniel, those prognosticators who stood before Nebuchadnezzar to foretell the future and to interpret dreams. Daniel chapter 2, verses 27 and following, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers show unto the king. They don't have a clue. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the dr visions of the dream upon thy head are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed what should come to pass hereafter, and he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But the wise men couldn't. The astrologers couldn't. The magicians couldn't. The soothsayers couldn't. But there is a God in heaven who can. And so, comparing that with Acts 13, verses 7 and 8, this is the Bar Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Bar uh, Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Remember, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. He says, come and do battle here in my court. I've got somebody who's telling me one thing over here, and he's got some power. And he's been able to foretell some stuff for me. But I hear that you guys also have some kind of power. And I want you to come and I want to hear the word of God. And suddenly the swords cross as Sergius Paulus listens to them. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith withstood them. Very interesting phrase used several times in the New Testament. This is a face-to-face -face showdown. There are unpleasant consequences when there is a face-to-face -face showdown. He withstood them. They were coming to serve Christ and he stepped in front and said, you will go no further. Try to get around me if you can. Have you ever had someone do that to you? Where you entered a room, and there were men standing there, and they said, you will not go up on this platform. Those are unpleasant confrontations, are they not? He withstood them. In this case, it was necessary to defend the faith. And we find that Paul says the same thing in Galatians 2.11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Peter had compromised the gospel. Peter was putting himself and those with him back under the law because of human pressure because of the Judaizers. And Paul withstood him because Peter had yielded to false doctrine. We find another illustration out of the Old Testament but quoted in the New Testament as Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also, and he's speaking of the apostates, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning what? The faith. You see, Elymas withstood them because he was seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. And Paul says it's just like Janus and Jambres. Satan has had his men around all through all of history. They withstood Moses. Now Moses was a pretty powerful man. Moses had to go face to face, toe to toe, nose to nose, 
with the Egyptian magicians. And they did miracles, and he did miracles, and they did miracles, and he did miracles, and they did miracles, and he did miracles. But finally there came some miracles that they couldn't copy. And they said to Pharaoh, this is the very finger of God. Even they had to admit it. They thought they were doing okay for a while. They withstood Moses because Moses had a message from God. And they were defeated. So do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. In chapter 4, he mentions one by name. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou where also? Listen to the next phrase. It's the same thing we find going on as there's this confrontation where the evil one withstands the proclamation of the gospel. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou where also? For he hath greatly withstood our words. You see, Paul experienced, in the very next verse, the same thing that he experienced with John Mark. Sometimes Paul was left alone, all by himself. Barnabas didn't run on that first occasion. But on other occasions, the apostle Paul was proclaiming the truth, and he had someone withstand him, and all the rest of the Christians ran. Listen to what he says. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. This happened to Paul more than once in his ministry. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. It was an occasion on which, if the Apostle Paul had not come out victorious, he would have been fed to lions. I think there's also a second level to that. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. You're standing your ground. But make sure you do it in the power of the Lord, in the strength of his might, with the whole armor of God put on, beginning with the word of God, ending with the word of God, your loins girt about with truth, and taking the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 2 Timothy 4.18 And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know, as we get over to the book of Jude, we find more opposition from Satan. When Michael the archangel contended with the devil over the body of Moses, even Michael was afraid to directly confront Satan, and he said, The Lord rebuke thee. But Paul, because there is someone withstanding the gospel as the authority to speak directly to him and call him a child of the devil. Michael is only contending for the body of Moses. You and I are contending for the truth of the gospel of Christ. You know, it's interesting as you look at the remaining few verses in this passage, what impressed the deputy was not the miracle but it says the doctrine of the Lord. Because you see, this miracle pointed to Christ. This miracle pointed to his power over the one who claimed to have power. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh boy, don't try to do anything like this without being filled with the Holy Ghost. The filling of the Spirit is a distinct work of the Spirit that occurs over and over and over again in the life of the believer. 
The other 37 works of the Holy Spirit occur once at the moment of salvation. But the filling of the Spirit is when you are yielded to the control of the Spirit of God. Filling deals with control. And that is the one we are given command to do. Be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5. One chapter before that discussion about spiritual warfare, where you're full of the strength of the Lord in the power of the Lord in his might. Filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Paul's eyes didn't wander. He didn't look up and shrug his shoulders and say, man, this is scary. I wonder what I should say now. And he said, oh, full of all subtlety. <laughs> Interesting contrast of filling. Filling with the Holy Ghost in verse 9 and filling with subtlety and mischief in verse 10. Those who are under the control of Satan are filled with his power. Filled with subtlety, that is deception, and all mischief, the desire to do all kinds of evil things. Thou child of the devil, thou enemy of righteousness. Remember, he's saying this in front of Sergius Paulus. This is the guy that Sergius Paulus has been relying on. The Apostle Paul doesn't mince any words about who that fellow is. You're an enemy of righteousness. The next phrase is very informative because it tells us that Elymas was doing exactly what Paul warned the Galatians about, preaching another Jesus, having another spirit, and preaching another gospel. Because listen to what he says. He says, Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord. Not cease to teach Buddhism or cease, cease to teach Confucianism. Cease perverting, that is twisting and turning and changing the right way of the Lord. This man, Elymas, had some knowledge, not merely of Judaism, but of what Paul was preaching about Jesus. And he had given a false gospel to Sergius Paulus, a gospel that would have, had Sergius Paulus believed him, ended Sergius Paulus in hell. And then Paul does one of the miracles of the New Testament. We've talked about the gift of miracles and the gift of healings before. They are not the same thing. Healings make you well. Miracles do not necessarily make you well. And here we find an illustration of that. Paul says to him, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind. He didn't heal him from blindness. He made him blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately... Not after a period of time he developed glaucoma and then he got some cataracts and they didn't have good enough surgeons out there on the island of Cyprus to get rid of the cataracts and do a new implant. It doesn't say that. It says immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. In fact, he was so blind, he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. God is in control. Paul had the gift of miracles, quite obviously, here. But look at verse 12. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed. Look at this last phrase. Being astonished, not at the miracle, but being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Paul defeats Elymas in spiritual battle. The deputy is paying close attention to that. We don't have all of Paul's speech before the deputy, but we know what Paul preached everywhere he went. He preached Christ, crucified, risen, coming again. We find many of his sermons 
though it is not recorded for us here. But in that confrontation, the, de the uh, Elymas is withstanding what Paul is saying. Paul is preaching and Elymas says, don't believe that, don't believe that, that's not so, listen to me. And finally Paul gets tired of it, just like he does of the demon-possessed girl, the girl with the spirit of Python in chapter 16, where he turns around and casts the demon out of her, and she can no longer make money for her masters, because every day she followed them, saying, these are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. I'm mocking it so that people would not listen. Satan uses many different tactics. But here, Paul performs a miracle, makes the man blind. The deputy realizes what Paul has been saying is true. It says he believed. Paul went from preaching in synagogues where a great group is gathered to the next call, which is for an individual man who has a demon-possessed counselor, and Paul has to get through to preach the gospel. And God saves that man, not by a miracle. He saves that man because the man believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. That is, who is Jesus? What did he do? The doctrine of the Lord is the gospel of Christ. It is Christ, the one who died for our sins, was buried and rose again. People, we get impressed with all the exciting supernatural activities that we see going on in the book of Acts. But remember, the purpose of all of that was to preach Christ. To preach Christ. You and I can't do the miracles, but you and I can preach Christ. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for the power of your word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We thank you, Father, for this illustration from the life of Paul of what it's like to do spiritual battle, warfare with Satan and his demonic hosts, and how Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost before he went into battle. He was a man who was prepared, a man who was seasoned, a man who had suffered, a man who was willing to stand and not to run, a man who knew that he had been called, he had been sent, He'd been commissioned, he'd been empowered, and now there was someone standing between him and the target of the gospel, and that was someone who had to be removed. And with the power that you gave to him, that man, Elymas, was removed, and the gospel got through. Father, we're in a community here where there are many who stand against the gospel of Christ. We pray that you'll help us to reach through the darkness to those who are lost, to those who are questioning, to those who wonder what is the truth of the gospel. Yesterday there were 8,500 people who received gospel literature that they might hear and know the truth. There will be those who withstand them. There will be those who take the seed and cast it by the wayside. There will be those who take the seed and it grows for a short time and then it withers away. There will be those who have the seed planted in their hearts, but thorns grow up and choke it out because of covetousness and things of earth. But Father, we pray that from that seed sown, there will be some who have received it, and it goes deep into the soil, and it brings forth good fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, some an hundredfold. And Father, we pray that that would even be that they would come here, that they might grow in faith and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, again, we thank you for your word and for the blessing that it has been to our hearts tonight. Use it in a way that most perfectly glorifies you, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Along the line of the spiritual warfare,